Hi. Hello. Hello. We are back. Welcome back to One, One Hand Two Ducks. Two ducks. One tried day we'll to do it that perfectly. We tried to do it at the same time. I tried to watch your face. It didn't work. Well. Um, but oh well. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back, yes. everybody. Thanks for joining us again. Thank you so much, guys. And awesome. uh, great. Yeah. Happy if you meeting. couldn't having you, how have you been, Selena? How was your week? My how week was your Christmas? Is, oh, well, yeah, I was going to say my week has been Christmas um, with three kids and it's been awesome. Um, we we had fun and they promptly got randomly bored for some reason after that. Um, but no, it was great. Um, the babies are they're fighting with toys, oh. though we gave them great toys each. You know, they just are like, no, I want the car, even though I was never interested in cars. Wow. But yeah, but other than that, it's been great. It's been nice and relaxing because there's been no, well, I mean, starting Christmas Day, there hasn't been any work or anything. So um, just fun and games. What about you? Nice. Yeah, same. I mean, no no small children running around. Three <laughs> Shih Tzus, always chaos. But, um, <laughs> but uh, just kind of. Uh, just a chill evening with me and my mom and my fiance and uh, lots of baking and eating. Um, mm -hmm. So it was, it was a good, it was a good holiday. Watched lots really? of Christmas movies. They did some yard work and they really wanted me to come outside and do yard work. And I'm like, I want to sit here and watch a Christmas story. I don't understand. <laughs> That's what Christmas is about. Not yard work. We can do yard work every day. This <laughs> is Christmas. But I went outside and I chopped down like a rose bush for them. Good job, Megan. Thank Good you. Good job contributing so to the family. I, I do what I can. <laughs> um, all right. So uh, in case you couldn't tell by our social media. Yes. This week's episode is our first in our off book Thank series. Yes. And it is Hamilton. Hamilton. Uh, so off, off book. Um, it's a term we use in theater to describe when things are, when you have to be finished by, you have to be off book by a certain point. At least with actors, we, we say like, you have to be off book with your lines. That means you have to have them memorized. It has to be ready to go. Um, so you can start adding on to the other elements of the show. And we thought that would be a fitting name for this series um, because we're not just taking a show and kind of fangirling out about it and all the different elements. We are a little bit, but you know, not too much, but we're really I mean, diving into. Have... Go ahead. Sorry, I was going to say I do have Hamilton earrings and Hamilton necklace and Hamilton, but we're not fangirling. I mean, um, but so, <laughs> but uh, it's more about exactly how uh, certain shows get put together, how much work it takes to get it to the stage, all the different people and things involved that you don't even realize. Um, and yes. we noticed this a lot with Hamilton, everyone kind of obsessing on the internet about certain aspects of the show, but what we didn't, at least what I didn't think people realized maybe or were taking away that this happens, like all the things that you can obsess over happen in a lot of other shows too. Yes. Um, and the creative so. geniuses behind the show, it doesn't, it's not just the actors and it's not just the director. It's, it's, it's a whole gamut of of people mm -hmm. to those ones that always, like I used to say this when I used to be a techie, you know, like who, those who don't get the applause, those of us who are standing in the back, who at curtain call are just in the dark and no one's really clapping. Maybe sometimes we get a nod from the cast, but, but yes. Yeah, so we're giving, this is the chance for those to get their applause. <laughs> Beautiful. And with yes. that, let's, dive in dive in all, all right so let's start uh at the very beginning um A very with... good place to start <laughs> um uh so the first thing we have we have a couple of topics that we want to go over and the first is the history of hamilton we're not going to go into the history of those historical figures we're going to go in the history of Hamilton, right? the show, um, and how it fits in musical theater. So we have the history of musical theater, right? Tiny, let's do like a two second 
two second, two minute history of musical theater. <laughs> I was about to say, that was the quickest musical theater I've ever seen. Can yes. you imagine <laughs> the, the college money I would save? Um, <laughs> so it starts in 1928 with Showboat, which is uh, actually the first musical to have uh, an integrated cast, black and white actors on the same stage. Huge, massive, Huge. And would you say that controversial. 1928. So yeah, big deal. Big deal. This is coming right <laughs> off the hill, heels of like vaudeville, um, burlesque, kind of that mm -hmm. whole bit. It's coming off the heels of that where we're actually getting into more um, uh, like full shows that connect, like storylines that connect through. When you look at the musical Hamilton, you can already see Lynn in his in his writing and in some of the other aspects of the show, they have integrated thing like musical theater history into the show already. So you have Lynn who him, he himself is already very influenced by Les Miserables. Mm -hmm. um, Les Miserables was the first show that really didn't stop for a scene. They sang through it. Right. Hamilton goes on that journey as well of not really having a spoken scene. They have spoken word, but they are like it's <laughs> not a spoken scene. Right. It constantly flows with the music um, in a way that like Les Mis would. Mm -hmm. You have characters giving soliloquies, essentially. You have different character theme music, mm -hmm. um, which comes along in different spots as well. And then you also have uh, little tips of the hats that he does to his own work in the Heights that he had won a Tony for, Tony's for mm -hmm. like 10 years prior. Mm -hmm. um, you have 1776, the musical referenced in um, John Adams' account where he says, sit down, John, and he sings the exact sit down, John, before he, but that's an entire song from 1776. <laughs> You have Nobody Needs to Know from the last five years when he's having his affair. Mm -hmm. um, spoiler. <laughs> <laughs> Probably should have said that at the beginning. If you haven't seen Hamilton on Disney yeah. Plus, this is a huge spoiler. You should um, definitely watch it. <laughs> you have you have a Pirates of Penzance nod yes. with I am the very model of a modern major general. Mm -hmm. And um, you have a South Pacific nod and you've got to be carefully taught. Yes. Um, so all these things at different points in musical theater history turn the world around, right? So you have South Pacific that actually sang a song about racism and how racism has to be taught. And that was massive at the time. Right. You have Pirates of Penzance, which toes the line between opera and musical theater. You have um, Last Five Years, which was like that big kind of two-person show that We've never seen a two-person show be so successful, and you have something like that that's all about a relationship. And Jason Robert Brown music, which is kind of like crazy and all over place, all over the place. Like that was his kind of big moment, mm -hmm. 1776, which is one of the first more historical shows um, that comment on the Revolutionary War in musical theater history. Yes. Um, and then obviously Les Mis, which broke a lot of modes back in the day. Right. Um, and then obviously <laughs> with his show. There's there's hip hop there's nods to hip hop as well and that's how mm -hmm. it brings it into the modern day clearly with his with his style is he um, took what is and this is a this is a musical theater thing too you kind of take the music that is popular at the time mm -hmm. so you you know you see kind of the older musicals really going for that kind of jazzy sound thing and then you have you know, like Rent going for that 90s grunge, mm -hmm. um, you know, Mamma Mia kind of calls back. That's why some of these shows like Jersey Boys and Ain't Too Proud have been really nice because it calls back the music of a time that you remember. Right. Um, and people remember Biggie and Tupac and, mm -hmm. you know, Destiny's Child. And so this is all, awesome. and it's still integrated into our lives today. And it brings in the music of today while also nodding to musical theater past. I know that you did some stuff. Yes. You had some thoughts on the writing process. Yes, yes. And, and writing in general. So um, would you, maybe I pass the ball on to you of to course, give us some darling. delightful pearls of wisdom. Caught the wait. ball, darling. Oh, wait, wait, throw it. Oh, I caught the ball. 
Yes. Good catch. Um, <laughs> thank you. I've been practicing. Um, but yeah, the the writing process has been very interesting to study. Of course, as we all know, Lynn manuel Miranda wrote it, um, and he has a very, very interesting process. Um, the one thing that I love about him is that he he is definitely one that waits to be inspired. He never forces any, it's not like Lynn woke up and said, I have to make this, I have to make a musical. I have to, I find, I have to, I have to, I have to find an idea. No, he literally let life be and he found inspiration. And when it came to Hamilton, as we know, he found, you know, he was just, he picked up a book in an airport and, you know, just started reading it in, um, on vacation. And all of a sudden he said it was rapping to him. He's like, Hamilton, they were rapping to me and um, he couldn't get away from it. He even says, you know, in, in an interview, he actually had this interview at Monteclair Kimberly Academy. And um, he had this interview and he was talking about how the writing process um, especially when it comes to lyrics and, and freestyling and all of that, it is literally a power that has to be developed. I was watching um, an In the Heights documentary on PBS, and it was also, he also mentioned a similar thing of saying um, how the process, he goes, I don't understand how I can be so familiar with the process, yet it feel completely unknown to me every single time I do it. Like, he, he it's still a struggle. It's still, like, hammering it out. It's still you know, exhausting and sometimes frustrating, but he's like, but it's worth it because whenever you get it all on that page and whenever it's all on there and it just sings to you and you know, you got it, it's magic. Um, and yes. And speaking of his, his nods to history, he was definitely inspired by uh, rent was a huge one. That was his breaking when he was still in high school. Cause he realized with through rent that musicals can be about me. It doesn't have to be about, you know, this this um, this abstract idea or about, you know, love or something, you know, how it used to be. It could be about how I'm feeling about the world around me. Um, and he loved it because he it it spoke a truth that he hadn't seen in musical theater at the time, you know, type of thing. And Rent was raw. You know, we were dealing with sorry, another spoiler alert, but dealing with AIDS and, you know, the 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 difficulties of being an artist, you know, a struggling artist, you know, and all that. And he loved it. He's like, man, well, well, if I'm, I'm going to be a struggling artist too, you know, <laughs> he embraced it because <laughs> he's like, because Rick said it, so I'm going to do it. So when he was making Hamilton, when he was writing, what was interesting is that he actually sent it. I don't know his connections. He actually sent his work to me, to Stephen Sondheim. Um, and if you don't know who he is, he is a huge, huge, huge legend in musical theater. And um, whenever he sent him that work, Stephen was so like surprised. He was like, this is genius. So um, although Alex Lacamoire and, you know, Thomas Kale was were very heavily involved in the writing process as well, um, he, he did keep it kind of close because as a creative, a lot of people don't understand what you're doing unless you're on the same wavelength of other creatives. And so he was very big on as a writer, like, you know, definitely collaborate, but collaborate with people who get you, who get you, who get the story, who get the vision, who get the goal. Um, so, yeah. And so basically, this is what I love, because you made nods to, you know, Les Mis and all that. And he said that whenever he was writing it, he did think about Les Mis. He thought about Jesus Christ Superstar and um, Andrew Lloyd Webber. And he said, because all of them were albums before they were shows. And that was his mm -hmm. full intention. That's why we have the mixtape and everything. And uh, he said, so I was, so after I read that book, I was going to get my Weber on. That's what he said. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> it's amazing. He's like, I'm gonna get my Weber on, and um, and he, he 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 talked to Alex, and you know, during "You'll Be Back," there was also nods to like other things, like the Beatles. Mm -hmm. I did the yes, Beatles from in in "You'll Be Back." Um, we had, and then Tommy was kind of like Tommy Kale, the uh, the director. It was very interesting their collaboration work, actually, the whole writing process, because Alex um, was like the the one who put the details in. He like dressed it, you know, Lynn right. brought the structure, Alex dressed it, and then Tommy pulled it together. Tommy zipped it up, you know, like, okay, let's yeah. pull it all into these, like, well, we don't need this. You're too, you're too far here. This is going too far here. And then they, and then bam. 
Um, and one thing that I absolutely love that um, even Tommy says throughout his when I was researching him too, but um, one thing I absolutely love is that when they came to the writing process with them was that there are the best idea wins, meaning, mm. meaning whoever is in the room, it doesn't matter who the idea is coming from. There's no ego. Leave your ego yeah. out the door. So nice. Lynn too. Lynn, yes, this is your thing. You, you conceptualize it, but even you leave it out the door and whoever has the best idea in the room, it wins. And which is That's so awesome. beautiful. Isn't it awesome? That's it's really so beautiful cool. because it, it 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 says everyone is important. Everyone has a voice. Everyone is everyone matters to this process, and everyone has a say in how this story gets said. But yeah, and from there, their whole writing process just evolved. Um, at the end of the day, he said, the whole writing. Whenever you pick something to write, you have to make sure that the story is as honest to you as possible. Mm -hmm. Um and then you'll get sucked in. And so, and, and I love it. He says the legacy, let your legacy be audacity. Nice. Nice. I love that. So, yeah. He also, so, he also is quoted saying, and I think this was during in the Heights. I think this was a quote that he had during in the Heights um, that ties into his creative writing process and also his knowledge of like history of musical theater, which is, Here's this kid who so desperately wants to be a part of musical theater in some way yes. and knows that that's what he wants to do and goes to school for it. And, you know, he lives in Washington Heights and he is trying so hard to be part of this business world, yes. <laughs> world this world of theater. And he knows deep down and he said it. Um, he's like, I know that if in order for me to perform, I'd have to have a classical voice and be much older so I could be Don Quixote and Man of La Mancha, or I'd have to be an amazing dancer and be Bernardo and West Side Story. Those are the only two roles for mm -hmm. Latin men. Those are the only two roles in musical theater. And at this point in musical theater casting, there wasn't a whole lot of diversity casting happening right. yet. Right. And so he knew he's like, if I, and he, and like, how great is that to not let that get you down, but to, make that be your inspiration of like, well, then I'm just going to, and like he I'm says, like, I, I knew I had to write my, if I wanted parts in this, in this business, I had to write my own stuff. I love and it. He did. And he wrote in the Heights and yes. it was crazy and amazing. Yes. Um, so. And that's why he even says, you know, um, uh, every musical is a leap of faith. Every musical, whoever wrote it is, it's a leap of faith. He's like, he's saying in the writing process, you don't know if this is going to be a hit or it's going to be terrible. And he's like, you can't focus on that just have to focus on the story you're trying to tell. And for him, like you were saying, In the Heights was so personal that mm -hmm. he's like, I just have to focus on my story getting told. I don't care whether it's big or not, as long as my story yeah. is told. And so he's like, my only fear was an unfinished idea. Yeah. you. I mean, you look back at In the Heights and it was, I mean, it came, it was 2003, 2004 mm -hmm. or 2004, 2005, one of those. And it was it was groundbreaking, but it yes. also followed that classic musical theater thing of like song, scene, song, scene, song, yeah. scene, right? Um, because that was where he was at the time mm -hmm. in his process and his writing and where yes. he honored classic musical theater as well. Yes. And that one took him seven years to write mm -hmm. and um, Hamilton took him six years. So again, his process um, is beautifully patient. And my shot took one of those six years. Yes, <laughs> exactly, exactly. And and I just love it. I love that he's not in a rush. I love that he just lets it be. the 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 creative people that I've seen that do that, um, it works. It works really well. Is patience. Mm -hmm. And I know the business is very quick. The bit, especially film. You know, the business is like, I need it now. I need it now. But really, I think we need to get back into the art of patience and the art of watching, putting a seed and slowly watching it grow instead of processed foods. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I like I like your thought process about like his taking his time and like just waiting for inspiration to come because he really did take inspiration and he is someone who's very influenced by New York City. Yes. And and he really did let the city kind of tell him when to write things. Like he wrote wait for it on the train to Brooklyn. Yes. He, you know, he had written the tag for um Helpless. helpless? Yes. So he had, <laughs> he had written the tag for helpless for someone else. 
not necessarily those lyrics, but the, the melody, he had written that melody for someone else and they were supposed to use it on their album, but it had been years and they had never used it. And he kind of went to them and was like, can I have that back? <laughs> right. And they were like, sure. And he's like, he, and he, you know, cause it's just something that he realized that actually would be perfect for this. Right. And you know, and he even talked about the editing process. I, oh my gosh. There was this, this hilarious story about what he wanted. Cause apparently Alexander Hamilton, um, discovered with Washington the whole um, Benedict Arnold thing. Oh, yeah. Um, the whole spy thing and how he wanted to ha include this whole story of Washington and Hamilton going to the house to confront him and then the wife coming out topless and with a baby. Yes, she was oh, topless right. with I a baby. Oh, I forgot about that. With a yes. baby and she's and, acting and she all crazy. acting all crazy and he goes, and he was like, couldn't focus past this damsel who was naked and beautiful and they basically let her go. And he's like, and I kind of wanted to keep that because I wanted to show that Hamilton loses his mind when he sees a beautiful woman and, and or a damsel in distress, which leads into the Reynolds pamphlet, why he so easily fell into bed with this woman who just asked for, you know, help in a walk home. Yeah. Although he really wanted it, he had to edit and only because mm -hmm. he's like, of course there's, because you know, people are like, well, it's not, his, there, there's missing things and it's not historically accurate. It's like, of course, but I can't, I'm trying to focus on presenting Hamilton. And mm -hmm. yes, there, the reason why Peggy's not in second act is because she died and all that, but I can't show everything. This is not Peggy's story. This is Hamilton's story. And I had to keep to his story. On stage, while they were on stage, there's moments where he still wanted to edit. Like, well, what if I, like, leave, put the pen down, put the pen down, it's over. <laughs> Oh yeah, because I mean, he he was writing things even on on when they were when they were teching, mm -hmm. that whole cross of him batting down the battery, check the damages. He yes. wrote Bruh. right on the spot on like a napkin because they <laughs> needed a transition. Like they mm -hmm. weren't going to be able to make a lighting or a cross work. They needed yes. something there, and so he wrote it real quick. And now that's like, I mean, like One an iconic moment, right? Because right. then he also got to put in the part about how Hamilton stole the British cannons. And that was massive yes, for him. It was massive because for him. Because then that's when George Washington like, rec like, like figured oh. out who he was. He's like, who just right. stole these cannons? Right. That was um, true. So now we've talked a little bit about um, Aunt, uh, Lacamoire and Kale, but the yeah. other the other person in this kind of quadruple tri qu quadfecta is Andy Blank and Bueller, the yes, Blake and Bueller, the car. Oh my God, I love him. So he is someone who is very heavily influenced by Jerome Robbins, mm -hmm. who Jerome Robbins choreographed a Gypsy on the Town West Side Story. Um, Andy Blank and Bueller did an interview where he talked about the way he choreographed for Hamilton. And he's like, yes. yeah, I had to, you know, I had to watch a lot of different things because I didn't really know a whole lot about he's and I think he he did in the heights as well. Yes. But he still was like, this has to be completely different hip hop than in, in the Heights than in Hamilton. Yes. It has to feel different. And he uh, is quoted as saying that he has to kind of uh, subconsciously manipulate the audience. Mm -hmm. And he uses one specific moment to kind of highlight this to, as like, for example, when you see the red coats, they are stiff, they are moving, they are forward, they're not fluid at all. When you see the blue coats, they are very fluid. And they're also not holding guns until Yorktown. Because that's also signifying, once we get the guns, we win, mm -hmm. kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so he has all these kind of things that tie in obviously like everyone knows the whole like burr walks and straight lines hamilton walks right. and curves thing mm -hmm. um but then you you have like a little i feel like him choreographing this there was probably a little bit of jerome robbins in the back that was saying um i asked you to sell it not give it away nice and nice. i feel like that's what he he kept straight to because what what he did and what a couple of the other creatives did which i have further down mm -hmm. is a subconsciously making the audience feel something while yes. also pulling the story forward right and have you heard of his process i didn't love him until today <laughs> and now i'm a huge fan <laughs> i didn't love him until today and now tell I'm a me huge why fan. Do, why do you love him now oh tell my gosh what, what so i was listening you? to his interview from pay, Playbill, the Playbill interview. 
And um, first of all, again, th now the crazy thing about today's like research for me, it was insane, is that you'll start to hear as we go through this podcast, there is a, sh there is a thread through all the creatives that they say the same things, but it's still often so it's not like they're collect it's not like they're on the phone going okay did you say that no it was from them and the fact that they brought this what was in them to each other and it just it just exploded but it was amazing but anyway yeah I one thing he that also too, says that was awesome. yes right because one of the first things he says is authenticity is a must and again going back to to, to um lynn saying honesty is everything his is off that you have to be authentic and okay his process dude i'm in love so this guy, Andy researches things on Pinterest, right? Um, like he say he, you know, he just researches random things. Like he has a whole, he has all these boards and he looks at just details of life, like how someone rolls up their shirt and how someone holds a cigarette and how someone looks when they're wearing certain shoes. And um, all of this becomes an inspiration when he's thinking about the characters. Like, okay, so how does this character, what kind of, he thinks about what shoes will they wear? And then from there, he kind of builds up on who, how do they hold themselves or whatever. And then he even dresses as the characters he's building movement for. He cannot nice. choreograph until he dresses as the characters nice. and in their shoes specifically. And then- Thank you. Let me just right? say as a girl who has had to wear many big skirts in the past, thank you, yes. Andy Blankenbuehler, for you. wearing a skirt for me. Right? And then he photo booths different movements he likes. He just takes pictures of movements and he captures them. And then he puts them together like a storyboard. And what then a brain. What exactly. a brain. It's amazing. <laughs> and then he, he basically said, I, exa I exhaust all possibilities and I experiment and experiment until I find the deeper meaning of the story and the characters. And I build from there. We must tell stories about people and we must tell them honestly, um, but told in dramatic ways. Nice. So we that so that the story can be seen and heard. But I just loved I loved that process of him. I could just see him just sitting there like, oh, okay, she's wearing his. Oh. Yeah. And I can say, I don't know, one of my favorite parts, and it's so random in Hamilton, but it literally is one of my favorite that I always look forward to. In the background, the ensemble is right before the Skylar sisters. When Burr is like, um, there's nothing than going downtown and slumming with the poor, uh, that whole thing. Okay. The background, the actors are doing, if you see, there's um, uh, there's two of them coming out and they, they are pretending to have canes and how they're walking. They're like, oh, yeah, it's my favorite part. I love that. And every time I, I don't even I don't even listen to Burr anymore. I'm like looking in the background going. <laughs> like that. That's awesome. And it's only a, bit, a, a brief moment, but he says those details are so important. It's details. True. You have you have this moment that is written in, but then it's it's also fleshed out through choreography and staging. Director and choreographer meet, which <laughs> yes. is the ensemble becomes the Greek chorus, and it continues yes. the story and it shapes the story, and that's something that has also been part of musical theater history where the ensemble is also part of it. They move the set pieces. They, they come in and out of reality around the characters. Mm -hmm. In some cases, manipulate the characters or show right. a past scene or, you know, whatever. Like they are this kind of ever moving entity that come right. in and out of reality. And it can't happen without such fluid, specific choreography and Very such true. specific staging. Very true. And that was my that was something that I hadn't seen in a while in in um, musicals is that intricate ensemble. Um, mm -hmm. You know, like usually they're just kind of almost like background actors in film. They're kind of there just to build the scene, to make it feel real. Um, but um, but other than that, they're kind of just not really integral to the story. While you cannot have Hamilton without that ensemble. They are 100 oh. percent integral. They are just as important as as the principal roles and and i love that like um of that there was no line that they purposely and intentionally had no line it didn't matter who they were you felt every person who was on that stage was telling a part of this story and that was beautiful yeah beautiful so so speaking of dresses and heels and things paul oh, taswell, paul taswell. 
Paul Taswell, the costume designer who won a Tony, um, also he also did hair. Oh yes, he also did In the Heights. He did Memphis. He did Color Purple. Mm-hmm. Um, Harry at the and movie. And I I wrote I wrote down. Oh, he did do Harry at the movie. Mm-hmm, he did. And he's oh, and he's gonna awesome. and he's doing MJ, a new musical coming out. Um, that, oh, that's about Michael oh, Jackson. That one. Oh, that one. Interesting. All right, mm-hmm. cool. <laughs> um, I wrote down. This is the this is the bit that I wrote down from him. Obviously, we know the kind of whole bit of like above the neck is modern, below the neck is um, classical. Mm-hmm. And I know from certain like costume aficionados that he got the exact detailing right on exactly how these outfits are constructed. He shows the passage of time with his outfits. And then, but then he also says um, one thing that he thought about during his process of designing these costumes. So what I wrote down as him saying was he, uh, what he wanted to focus on when he designed these costumes was he wanted to get the cast to relate to their clothes like they relate to their t-shirts and jeans. So he mm-hmm. wanted, even though they were historical, he wanted to give the cast that same feel of I'm putting on my t-shirt and my jeans and I'm going to dance in the street kind of thing. Right. He wanted that same feeling and he wanted them to have their own identity with it. Mm-hmm. And not mm-hmm. just like this person's the yellow girl and this person's the right. in red. Like they right. all have their own identity that goes with their things. Yes. Like you notice the neckline of Mariah Reynolds is lower just slightly than the other ladies. And it just, it already gives you, granted it's a red dress too, but it also gives you a little extra of like something. Oh, up. she, you know oh, what I she, mean? Uh, she, uh, mm-hmm. yes. Um, <laughs> you're rare. <right? laughs> um, and, and that's what I loved. I loved his process too. And again, his, here comes another thread. Um, he's Jimmy. big on collaboration, collaboration mm-hmm. and story. When he, his process of research is, and he was saying this on the um, producer's perspective interview, um, he was saying that the process um, is he looks for images similar to Andy of like, you know, the time period and, and all those. Um, but then he puts it, he takes that and then he, he, he looks at the story. So he's like, it depends on the, the director's point of view. And he kind of rely, he says it's imperative that directors employ um, that point of view um, and finding what best serves the piece. Um, and I can just imagine too, like say, Say Thomas Kell was like, actually, you know, we're not going to do this. Say he's just said for a moment, like, oh, we're not going to do it, anything modern. Then he would have just kept to the, you know, the beautiful period pieces solely. He wouldn't have put the girls in pants or anything. But um, he served the purpose of the story, not the bigger story, not just Hamilton's story, but like the bigger goal of, mm-hmm. of, of the story being told to the audience. So what about, you know, if, if other people are going to be wearing your costumes and, or trying to make your costumes in the future, blah, 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 blah. He's like, and I love this because I feel like there's a deeper meaning, even though it's literal. He said, um, design stays the same, but the fit is custom. And although that's literal as a creative, we know he means deeper, mm-hmm. not just the fit like, oh yeah, because I have to take it in here because she's smaller or she's bigger or whatever, but fits the actor. How mm-hmm. the actor and how the director are approaching these roles, that's the custom fit I think he's talking about. Continuing on with perspective and design, mm-hmm. David Corrins. Yes. The set designer. I have him uh, kind of saying that the, the Hamilton set is the lowest running cost of any set design he has done in the last 15 years. Mm-hmm. Obviously, mm-hmm. we've got double turntable. We've got a set that stays exactly the same pretty much the entire show with little tweaks here and there. Mm-hmm. Um, and he has one thing that, and like his whole thing was you you have to back away from your impulse of wanting to make it super like intense and crazy and this and that and find truth in storytelling. There it is and again, truth. It's backing away from ego and letting storytelling really happen. And he had this really great thing where he said, there are really overt and obvious things that the set is doing. And then there are incredibly subtle things that the set is doing that are just as impactful that no one knows about. And yes. I feel like that's the same thing in choreography, right? Like he's doing yes. things court, like to the actors in their choreography that we are not even paying attention to, but right. it, we feel it 
behind from like rifles and racks to scrolls and parchment because that's when we go from fighting to like writing and he's like and you know no one sees it we lose the ropes we tie things off we buoy and hunker down and become the fledgling nation that we are no one sees it they see the turntable and they're like congratulations you made a turntable exactly so i thought that was funny because <laughs> that you know, is funny Yes. Turntables are like people are like, oh, a turntable. Oh, and turning. then it's, it's a double turntable, so it can go different yes. ways. People are like, oh. oh. Exactly. I loved him it's too. So Again, wonderful. this is a creative person that has a brain that I just want to explore all the time. I just want to sit in a room with, with da- all of them. I want to sit with David. I want to sit with Paul. I want to sit with Andy. I want to sit with Alex. I want to sit with Tommy and Lynn and just, just literally talk to them for hours because their brains are amazing. One thing I love about him is, again, he goes deeper than just creating a set. He talks about, a, you gotta, he's like, when I design, I approach it as a psychologist. And um, what's the person's space? Like, like it's not, you know, he, and I love it. He's also funny because he's a funny guy, right? So also another funny thing is he's the one of the very few people that actually had to audition and apply for the job. Oh yeah, yeah, I did see that. Yes, and he and and that was the thing too is he knew he didn't really know a whole lot about it. He didn't know any of the songs. He didn't Mm -hmm. like. I don't think he got like much of a script. He just got concept, and he made something kind of on a concept before he started really hearing. Before he was hired to like really do something. And he said in his interview that um, because someone asked him, they're like, "Oh yeah, so you had to interview." He's like, "Yeah," and even though he was working with a few of them already on other projects, but he's like, yeah, and I interviewed and I said, listen, this is my shot and I'm not throwing it away. And he's like, I put all these references that I could and I knew in my interview so I could get the job. That's so that's cute. Awesome. Um, and then two years later, and again, we'll talk about Thomas Kale's process. Two years two later, years later in, in Hamilton already? Like in the no, rehearsal no, no. process? Or? Two years later, yeah, two years later in the process of rehearsal. Okay, got gotcha, job. gotcha. And he says, um, that he goes, people might not notice the 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 gloss or the detail of the doorknob but as an actor when you're on stage and you see that detail i am here you know or the or or maybe not most of the audience will notice but there might be that one person the audience that might be like that doorknob detail is amazing he's like so there are no small parts you know those eyelashes are important and i was like they are important <laughs> You never know because you never because what did Mr. Edwards always tell us? You are like on stage. Yes. Someone is always looking someplace else. So you, you have to be on whether that's set, whether that's lights, whether that's on. actors, every, it has to be on. It's true. Every time because someone's going to be looking somewhere else. The action's going to be happening over here, but then there's going to be exactly. one person like, look at exactly. that thing. You know what I mean? <laughs> and it's a similar process up? to like Andy and Paul, you know, the research draw, map, psychology of space, draft, and then build. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> he has these like normal stuff and then psychology, thinking of the space, and then map and then build, and then draft, you know, like and all that. So I just, I loved, again, I just love his process and his way of thinking of something more than what it is, deeper. Howell Binkley. Um, is amazing. He, he actually has passed or just passed recently, maybe a couple years ago. Um, but dude, if you ever look him up and look up his interviews, the dude's face, you just feel his energy. He has such a beautiful soul. That's all I could think about. Anyway, I even put that in my notes, like oh, best smile ever and beautiful soul. His eyes, just, nice. oh, his eyes light up. Aww. No wonder he's in lighting. He's just, oh, he's just, no wonder he's enlightening. He lights no up he's the lighting. inside out. He's a beautiful person. I love um, that. But um, he was talking about lighting, of course, <laughs> and um, he was talking about it's basically like sculpting. It's uh, it's in, in the same way of sculpting the body. That you the light how it hits the different places on the body, the different angles on the body, and um, and he's in his process is um, he he talks about formatting, which is the process of spending time with production and mapping the whole story out. Um, taking one scene at a time and the transitions. So he was heavily involved with Lynn, talking to him probably all the time, like, okay, you know, what is this? What are we trying to say every scene at a time? Um, and then he talks about how the and costumes are important in the collaboration because he doesn't want to 
discredit Paul's work um, and, you know, have the colors clashing or, or anything like that. We don't, he's like, we don't want to fight. We want to weave mm -hmm. palettes together. Um, um, and, uh, and it was so cute because he's totally an old school lighting director who came into the new school. So he got really gigged out about um, the new way of lighting. Apparently it's computerized. So he's like, he's like, he's like, you can build in like a hundred oh, yeah. different colors and templates and, and effects and they all just do it by computer. So he was like kicking out. I was like, that is so adorable. Um, but it, gone are the days. Gone <laughs> exactly. are the days when you'd have to climb like, a ladder like, and change like, a gel like, then you, you just had a scene and that's what it is. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> but, um, but again, he talks someone up there with a follow spot <laughs> but he talks about of course um having <laughs> looking at the story and what mood the lighting is going to affect it in and the chemistry of finding that and, and the beauty of it but um again it's all about team effort and collaboration um he mostly follows the director but being in a in a space where you are heard he he got a lot to say and he's just a beautiful soul <sighs> okay <laughs> nice Ooh, Nevin. All right, Nevin Steinberg, sound designer. Ah, he said that Hamilton was the type of show <laughs> sound designers live for. The whole point is to help people focus on what to listen to and nice. guide them through the story. Now, Hamilton itself is uh, obviously groundbreaking musical, but in many ways than just the few we've named, their sound design is also insane. They have 172 speakers. The speakers above uh, the main, like the stage, the main line, like right in the front are the first of its kind to be used in a Broadway show. The design itself, like the systems that they use are usually used for performances, like big performances. There's subwoofers. There's, he said, he's, he said that Lynn told him Hamilton is going to be the quietest nice. musical and the loudest yes, extremes. Musical. It needs to be mm -hmm. both. And we have to find everything in between. And there's even, Ooh, there's even speakers fancy. under the chairs of the theater. Um, different parts of the theater has, have different mixes because mm -hmm. of you, then you start getting into things like echo and whatnot. Um, and he says, sound design is really about story storytelling and attention to detail. Human ears connect directly to emotional, uh, the human ears direct, uh, <laughs> human ears connect directly to emotional centers in our brain. And therefore the way we process sound affects how we feel. And so he was very intense about how he makes the sound come out of the speakers and mm -hmm. how it makes you feel hearing it, how loud, how soft, what sounds those are, how they're mixed throughout the theater and amazing. how you're receiving the sound. Groundbreaking. 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 These people, dude. These people. Oh my gosh. Okay. And it's true because, I mean, think of like a conversation. Depending on how you hear the words changes the whole meaning. Even though someone might not intend a certain way, mm -hmm. but if you heard it a certain way, you're like, oh, no, you didn't. And they're like, what? I just said that. And they're like, ah. But yeah, it's very true. But like, but like you said, most of these people that we, especially on the tech side, are seasoned people. So they have, they, this is their process yes. that they go through with every show, whether or not they get to use that voice, whether or not they get that freedom mm -hmm. to kind of really express that budget, whatever it is, it all depends. But they, they, they go into right. everything knowing like story. But then depending on what they have to accomplish, what is given to them, what they have to do, someone else tells them it might be different stories. Very so unique. that's why yes. I think Hamilton was something so special for all of them because they were able best to- Best idea in the room wins. Best idea in the room wins. Yes. Leave the ego at the door and give it all to story and not about like, right. oh, these lights are going <laughs> to exactly. win me a Tony. It's like- No, they weren't. You know what I they mean? They're not thinking story. that. Um, and be, so I do want to get into Thomas to kill, but before I do, I'm going to get into the stage manager, mm -hmm. Jason Bassett. Oh, what a good idea. Hey, so Jason stage Bassett managers? is the stage manager and then Jeffrey Sell Seller is the producer. Um, yes. So Jason Bassett, the stage manager is, um, 
I loved it. I loved watching. I mean, he didn't have much. It was hard to research him because there's not much on him. Because again, that's one of those roles that people don't understand. So and they ignore. Um, but it is a crucial, crucial role um, that, you know, like, you know, how crazy it is to be a stage manager or like I'm the, telling the, you watching a stage manager run around trying to stage management everything. stage management they are a bridge that is constantly on fire they are a bridge fire. <laughs> from the actors to the tech and it's on fire yes. all the time <laughs> all the time and the director and the other producer all yeah. the other production and creatives they are constantly being pulled and tugged and, and if they have to make wrong, sure it's their fault it's like it's their fault <laughs> They're the ones, if you don't know what a stage manager does, they're the ones that handles the day-to-day. -day. They're the ones that that also call every cue. They're the ones that <laughs> make sure the lights go on at, when they're supposed to, the sound goes when it's supposed to. The, like if somebody's mic is on, it's the stage manager's fault. Like all that, all of it. They got to make the phone calls to, to people if like someone calls yes. out that night and the sub has yep. got to go on. Like they're the ones, baby. They got to make sure everybody's there on time. They got to, yes, they they are the ones that keep, the, they're like the, the, what is it, the, 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 the tickers behind the clock, those little things, the, all the, the gadgets behind the clock. Yes. Yes, that's exactly what they are. Um, but he was talking about um, how being a good stage manager, and he has and he has um, people that he was inspired by. Apparently, there's an, a woman named Bonnie Becker who was the stage manager for Billy Elliot and School of Rock. Um, he, he loves her, and he also loves um, Stephen Beckler, who did Wicked stage managing. Um, but he talks about the the... the to do it best is to number one, remember that you are managing artists and that artists have their own needs. Um, and when, and people skills are the most important thing you can have. Yes, being a stage manager, you should be very organized. He's like, organization is one of those skills that yes, but above that, you have to have people skills. Um, and he goes, and to me, and this is, I loved this. I loved this just for life. But he said to me, if every, I feel like I'm enforcing anything that means that i've missed a process of planning Ooh. or that it's been poor planning Ooh. enforcing equals poor planning he goes because if i've if i have really efficient planning and i have good foresight into all the possibilities of what could happen then i should never have to enforce any rules or anything um that it should it should all just flow naturally because i've, I've done the work um and he he says uh, that every show, of course, is in a sense the same, but then also they have their uniqueness and to find its personality and invent uniquely. But yeah, nice. I, I loved it. I, I just loved I love that, especially that enforcement part, because it's so true. Like um, and that's, I think, it just uh, a risk. Again, it goes back to leaving ego out of it. Mm -hmm. You know, this is not about me. I, I do know I have a job to do and I'm going to make sure I do the best job possible but i'm serving the production yes yes and i love that so thank you jason Thanks, bassett. jason bassett <clears throat> yes um I, so now producer jeffrey seller also did in the heights um he's a part of the crew he's a part of that whole the group of 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 amazing minds that continue on every show i'm like can i be in can you invite call me <laughs> somebody call me Jeez. My number hasn't changed. <laughs> Call it's the me. Same. You can look me up right now. Email me. I'm on social Jeez, media. Are you right? Lynn. I'm here. Andy, Jeffrey, somebody. Anytime of night. Can I be a part of the squad? Gosh. But anyway, so yeah, so he did um he also produced uh, in the Heights. And um I loved what what he was saying about what specifically Hamilton. He was talking about this story being so unique because um, of course it's a story of America to, uh, uh, it's sorry it's a story of America yesterday told by America today mm -hmm. and that we all because of so many f facets we all get to say this is my story or when we're watching it that's my story however we approach it whether we're you know you know white from the sticks Republican or seven or 10 black and doesn't know anything about politics we all still say this is my story yeah. um and that's my story we can we can all find ourselves in it somewhere um and uh and and that's because they there were there was a focus of exploring the possibility of what america can be and 
showing us also what it is not. Ooh, Ooh at the same time, because he was talking about this whole this showing the like with with George Washington being black, you know, like showing this possibility of okay, in the future there will be a black president. In the future, this can be the norm that this this can be like seeing people of color all all over the cabinet and all over and the we're Senate not and even all over the house commenting on it. And not no even one's questioning blinking. Yeah, and it. It's not even a thing. It's not even a big deal. There's no like big parties every single time. It's just normal. Um, but it's also at the same time showing us, but it's not yet there. And there's also this kind of like, but we still have somewhere to aspire to. Um, and he it, it talks about the, that's that whole cognitive dissonance that's there. That's so uh, funny that um, you brought that up because I had actually written down something. And this is my own thought about like, what's clear is musical theater is ever changing. It reflects the music of our time because I was ta- that was my like thought process about music of the time. And it holds up a mirror while also lighting a path. Ooh. <laughs> That's me cool making coops. Um, but you know what I mean? Like it shows you yes. some of the ugliest parts of of your of, of the possibility of what is around you, but then it also shows you, well, then he, but here's the way out. But here's, here's the, the way, way forward. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. And now to talk with my second favorite person. I mean, you're all my favorite. I have actually a lot, all of you are my favorite, but I really do. And maybe it's because I too have this director's heart. I, I really direct, and it's funny because same thing with Thomas, me and him have a, quite a few things in common. Directing was never a thing that I ever thought about mm. until I thought about it. Um, he never aspired to be a director. It was never his thing. Yes, he and Lynn went to school together, but as you know, they didn't know each other. He was like, he's just some freshman. You know, he didn't, he didn't think about him. He was off doing his own life. Um, and then, but, theater and directing literally just fell in his lap and he felt like he was late in the game and he did a lot of research but um but he but it's something that called once he figured it out he was like oh this is it you know um and uh and man do i love him so anyway so one of the first things i he was in um this interview the the new school interview you should definitely watch it. it's really cool listening to him and talking to this um wonderful woman. But um, so he talks about that when he approaches any role, I mean, sorry, any, any show that he's about to direct um, and approaches actors that he's about to audition, he focuses on humanity. He focuses on their humanity. And it's, and he goes, because, we, you know, when you think of the audition room, we always think of it's the actor who's trying to get the role. Mm-hmm. Um, am I right for this role? Am I right for this? And then he's like, but really it's a both. Are we right for each other? And he actually says that that he believes the current audition process is actually broken. I agree. Because there's not, Continue. yes, me too. <laughs> <laughs> because there's not enough of that. There's not enough of seeing, seeing the person. It, it, there's too much, let's just fill the role. Let's just fill the role. And not let me see you as an artist. Let me see you as a person. Let me see you and then see if you and I can tell this beautiful story together. Um, and so that's why whenever he does the process, he does a long, very long audition process. And as we were talking about, a very long development rehearsal. Because technically when they're rehearsing, they still didn't get the part. Yeah. Technically. It's not it's not guaranteed yet. That whole two years before uh, um, D- David got on there, um, they were still workshopping. Which is they had people, you know, like that were that they had ideas of of okay where we're gonna put them, how we're gonna do that. But there was it was still a process, and they were not final on anything yet. And, and I, there, I also love that. Be- and there were a lot of people that are credited for the workshops. There were a lot of people mm-hmm. that were in the 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 off Broadway run at the public that you yes. know that you switch out and that happens with casting everyone knows like the classic story that adina menzel wasn't the original alphaba and wicked when they were right. out, doing their out of town sit down and there was all that big drama when she replaced somebody and 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 but then you have this cast right like you just have to find yes. the magic that works together exactly exactly and i love that because he was even talking about how usually you know a show starts they have a couple months of rehearsal then it's already on and blah 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 and he's like no you know whenever again he likes the 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 whole experience of building 
slowly because also they're and that's why even today as some of as many fans will know the hamilton cast still talk all of them still have they have their own chat and everything they're still very close together because they went through this deep can i get on the chat again okay anyway. is it a um, whatsapp <laughs> it's a whatsapp can i um but um but uh i love it because then he talks about the the importance of making us making a safe place mm -hmm. Um, and seeing things that um, that he can no longer oh oh so he talks about making a safe place because he realizes that as a director the reason why he chose director is because he it's funny he was actually really into sports and soccer and everything um, and then you know he he everyone grew and he didn't and and it just gave him a perspective that hey there are certain things that I can't do and I know that some people really get really upset about that and really like oh what was me but he's like no this is okay and this is good. So whenever he's looking at people and looking at things, he's like, he's seeing things that he can no longer do, but it's it's still true collaboration. And he believes that to be true collaboration. He's like, I can't sing, I can't dance. I would love to be in the show, but uh, but hey, let's get you guys who are really good at your skills and really good at your crafts. And now we can make this beautiful, beautiful show. Um, and um, he says that, uh, I love it. And how he approaches every actor, this is gold, by the way. He approaches them uniquely, meaning like he says, his direct quote was, every dressing room is a different relationship. I have to give different actors what they need because one of the, one of the, the interviewing lady is a Uta Hagen, you know, um, student. So she's like, oh, um, and you know, Uta Hagen is, was big on, on creating that space internally as an actor, like, okay, what was the previous scene? Where am I coming from before I enter the stage? Like what, it, what was my character doing before I enter the space. The moment before. And then she's like, oh, do you ask? Yes, the moment before. And she was like, do you ask your actors to do this too? And he's like, no, some like this, some don't. I approach every actor with what they need. Some actors need more exploration. Some just come in and they're like, I'm ready. You know, he's like, I, I, they all have their own process. And I'm, I, he said, I dare not impose my own. I was like, oh, oh mm, so good. Dude is on fire. Dude is on fire. It's that whole um, like positivity grows from these people. Yes. They recognize their own limitations. And instead of letting that weigh them down, they grow from it and go beyond it and search for the things that, that are search for the people or the things that I don't know. They search for the people yes. that can. <laughs> that can make it work. Yes. And they, and like I said, true collaboration. It's and, and I love that again, that they leave it out, the ego out the door. The best idea wins. They only do what's best for the story. Mm -hmm. It's about the story. It's not about anything else. And I love that. And um, and one more thing about or um I just want to say two more things. And the first one is I love his also um uh, the very first rehearsal. So as, as many, if you are an actor, if you've been in production, you know that most first rehearsals are a table read mm -hmm. or, you know, a production with those kind of things. He doesn't do one. Yeah. He doesn't do a table read until maybe the third day. The first day when it comes to musicals, he says, I just want to spend time with this, with the actors and solely the the story the 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 pulse huh. with 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 Hamilton it was just the music he said the first day we just get straight to work the first day he's like I just put everybody around a piano and we just listen and ding ding things out and 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 go through that like process but there is no he's like later maybe he goes around the by the end of the first week then maybe we'll have a table read but he just goes straight into let's let's just jump in with with our co collaborative energy and come not stifle any impulses. And, and I love that because he also, um, <laughs> for for stage plays, um, he says, uh, he's like, he does like to at least put the blocking up for like very first rehearsal. We're gonna block it. And he, he doesn't care if it's, he doesn't want it to be perfect. He just wants to see it. And then he says, and then we'll just stumble through each day and tweak what works, what doesn't work. What, what is your, he just likes to see the actor's impulse and, um, and then go with that and uh, allow it to transform itself. Um, so impulse is everything to him. And he says, whenever you're stuck, listen to impulse. Nice. I, I love the dude. And I, so I have been in, I have been in one workshop before and because I think because it was my first workshop and I, you know, I didn't know what was going on. Um, it was way more collaborative with the actors, like the creative, um, 
team was very interested on on seeing what the actor, actors thought about the way the script flowed, about their relationship to each other. You know, that was definitely a more, uh, that was more prominent than I think I even realized. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you think maybe you're just given a script and you go, you know what I mean? But there, there was something of like, you know, someone says like, uh, I don't understand. Like if, if we're going to say this, then why is she going to say this later? You know what I mean? Like right. if anything, she should say this. And that's why like there, there kind of is this thing now of like, in, like actors are part of the creative process. So you got to yes. pay them like they're part of the creative process. Exactly. But anyway, exactly. that's a different story for another time. That's <clears throat> <clears throat> yes. And I did forget. Sorry. I lied. I, I had two more things I wanted to say about something real quick. But um, uh, the whole um, so we people always talk about the whole diversity thing as if it was um, like they were thinking about, oh, yeah, we have to make this diverse. Actually, that's not true. Um, both Lynn and Thomas um, confirmed that that with Thomas's point of view, he just wanted it as far as possible to to traditional, you know, history as possible. So to him. That it came out of that. He, he's trying to make a huge cut, like wherever he can, make it the exact opposite. He can, and with when and with with Lynn, it was more about who he heard. Mm. You know, whenever it was, whenever he was think, writing Hercules or whenever he was reading about Hercules Mulligan, he's like Buster Rhymes. You know, oh, Hercules, you know, Buster blah, 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 blah. Hercules Mulligan. He's like he just sounded. He was sounding like that. So I cast it around that. It wasn't necessarily, oh, I need a black actor or I need, they just, they just casted from what they felt, what they heard and from just being wanting an opposite. And, uh, and like we said, the whole, there's no ensemble. And, um, and his thing was about, um, yes, most directors want to make impressions, but he's like, but the real importance, and this is going to lead us into our next thing is making connections with the audience. Nice. Not impressions. Connections. Connection. Nice. Don't impress them. Connect with them. I love it. <laughs> so bringing this right around full circle, yes. we have a musical that, uh, you know, went about the way musicals do and yes. did their off-Broadway run at the public theater you know, from workshop to public to Broadway. They started the digital lottery because it was just so insane. On 46th Street, it would get so packed for people wanting to do the lottery. Cars couldn't go down. So they started the digital, digital lottery, which now a lot of other shows partake in, which is fantastic. I have not won, but it's still great. And then they started doing the ham for ham show um, for all the people that were waiting that would never get to see it because they wouldn't win the lottery. So they started doing the ham for ham show to announce the lottery. That's an awesome idea. Um, but then they kind of started, they branched out and it just wasn't about their show. They invited other shows to come and sing for ham for ham or do something or, you know, Lynn would go across and, and sing um, the part of the uh, barricade person in Les Mis. I forgot what that's called, but like you at the barricade, listen to this. You in the barricade, listen to yeah. this. Yes. Like he went over and did that one night and he like passed it. He's like, that was, I've always wanted to be in Les Mis. <laughs> um, but you have this it, incredible importance in musical theater history. Now that the show is now cemented in of, of everything that it has, it has done for musical theater, everything that is done for future shows and uh, everything it has done for New York as well and and really kind of made the city tingle again. Um, mm -hmm. And obviously it will be one of the first things to come back when we talk about like musical theater and shows coming back. Um, and to finish out this uh, podcast, let me tell you a little story. I've been wanting to tell you all week, but I've been saving it for this podcast. <gasps> oh, yes. I'm so excited. The year was 2014. I was in rehearsals for a little show called Evita. My friend Justin was in the ensemble of Evita with me. I was the understudy for Ava and he was the understudy for Che. And, you know, you you get to know each other in the ensemble because like day two, you, you got to put your hands on each other and move each other around. Mm -hmm. um, so at one point, 
I think the the we were like, oh, we're gonna do this tomorrow, something like that. He's like, oh yeah, I won't be here. And we're like, what? Where are you gonna be, Justin? You know, because the, also the rehearsal process when you're doing regional theater is very short. Um, so we're like, what? He's leaving. And he's like, yeah, I'm I'm doing this thing. Like, what is it? He's like, well, you know, Lin Manuel Miranda. He's the guy that wrote in the Heights. We're like, yeah. He's like, well, they're doing like a kind of like a workshop, but and they're rehearsing it for this new musical that they want to take to the public theater off Broadway. And like, what they do in a workshop is they'll like really mount it, but not stage it completely, um, and bring in a bunch of people with money so they watch it and then like, oh yeah, we would love to see this in its bigger form. Here's some money, go do it. Right. Mm -hmm. So you have a couple, you have like a couple days of rehearsal for this, or maybe like a week. And, um, he was like, well, he's, he's going to be out for like two rehearsals or one day of rehearsals or something like that. And they obviously can't slow the pace down or he wanted to sit outside of it. Like there was something going on where he wasn't going to be able to be in the actual show. So Justin was going in to fill in for him. And I was like, well, what's this show? And he goes, it's called Hamilton. And it's about Alexander Hamilton, the guy that's on the $10 bill, the first treasury secretary. I'm like, that sounds boring. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Oops, ate my words a couple years later. But Justin went and he and he did it and he came back. We're like, how was it? He's like, it was amazing. Like, this is going to change musical theater. And we're all like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, everything changes musical theater. Every show changes. No, guys, like, listen. And he was trying to tell us and like he was so excited and we all kind of dismissed him. And I feel bad. Sorry, Justin. Um, at the time. We love you, Justin. We love you, Justin. But he he was trying to kind of let us know exactly what this was. And it was funny because then I think it was like a year later when it was at the public, I remember seeing like flyers for it and be like, oh, that's that show Justin was in. <laughs> wow. One degree away, Selena. I'm one degree away from the Hamilton wow. creative team. One. See, they could call you and then you can call me and then we could and we could get in. I know. We're a pair. <laughs> we go together. Thank you Call for me. all your research that you have done on this show. I enjoyed it, actually. And, and, you know, usually when we hear the word research, it sounds like strenuous and like a task. No, I got so inspired. Um, I just knew and I kind of felt like because um, Lynn said because he, he was talking to kids in the interview I watched. And um, he was like, you know, if you can do anything else, do it. Because this, you know, because the creative world is very difficult. You are going to be struggling. Um, you are going to have to go through the work. But he's like, but if it won't leave you alone, if you cannot stop, if you, if it's itching every turn you go, then just do it and see what happens. And listening to not only Lynn, because actually Lynn was one I watched last. I watched uh, all the other dudes first um, and dudettes. Dudettes? No dudes. We don't um, have, any, and, we uh, have any dudettes. I know we don't do that. <laughs> what the heck? We yeah, we gotta we get got, some I mean, ladies up in here, honey. We found one flaw. Well, there. But, um, I think the, yes. the assistant costume designer was a lady. Yes, I know that. Yes, because <laughs> yes. Paul works with her all the. He said he's worked with her for years, but um, but yes, uh, but anyway, like when I was watching all these interviews and watching all and doing this research, I just felt this sense of yeah, like this is what I have to do. I have to be, it doesn't have to be big. I don't necessarily need to be big. I don't need to be, I just need to do it. I just mm -hmm. need to be in this world, you know, like even if it's a, a tiny little like state, even if it's Hawaii, even if it's Rhode Island, even if it's this tiny little place, but I have to be in this space where I'm around creatives and we're creating mm -hmm. for the rest of my life. Nothing is going to make me Nothing is going to give me that, that, that boom, you know, in my heart, nothing's going to, nothing's going to do it for me. And, and both Thomas, Lynn, as you know, because of the lyrics and all that, all of them talked about legacy. And, um, there's a point, even, um, even Christopher Jackson, who plays George Washington in the Heights documentary was talking about that too. Like at one point I had to really think about legacy and maybe it's this, you know, this weird sense of morality or what, but, but I don't want to just live and have a good job. I, I need more, you know, I, I, I need more and, and I need to put a stamp, even if it's the smallest thing, you know, one of the, sorry, I, I know I'm going on a tangent, but one of the greatest um, 
moments I saw with 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 our in-house legacy is what our theater teacher, Mr. Edwards, left. Because to me, that showed that no matter how small you think you are, your legacy can stretch so far. Because our theater teacher, y'all don't know our theater teacher unless he went to LVA <laughs> during his years, but the legacy of that man, what he did, the, when whenever, because he's passed now, and I saw the flood of international, I'm like, this is just some theater teacher in Vegas. And he has such inspiration. Well, that's the that's the yeah. whole point, right? Is is <laughs> yes. legacy is what kind of grows legacy. beyond is the seeds you plant that you don't get to see, that you right? Don't get to see, and mm -hmm. and in a way, it's us, right? We mm -hmm. are the seeds that he planted, and yeah. what we create is part of what he started. <laughs> I'm gonna cry. I know. Don't make me cry. This yeah. is going to be too much, um, <laughs> but. You know, when we, when we, it's so true. when we talk about, and, and like Hamilton is special and Hamilton is also not special in the fact that there are plenty of shows and plenty of, of moments creatively that have meant so much to people that have changed the world in a way, right? There's little moments everywhere. And what Hamilton, I think, highlights is that honesty and that non-ego and that stepping back and that yes you mm -hmm. have to ha yes you have to want it and you have to drive and get there but you also have to you have to be willing to let certain things go for the mm -hmm. better of it and see and like cuz once you add the actors in the show becomes yes. something different that you would never exactly. imagine because they have their own ideas that they then bring to the table that then change your ideas. And that's why I think one of the reasons why I'm glad we didn't go over the actors is because each cast, each person that comes in will change it. Yes. And you, yes. I mean, none of us are going to go see the original cast live ever, no. but that doesn't mm -hmm. stop us from going to the theater and seeing a phenomenal cast that changes us or that exactly. shows us something different that we didn't see in the original cast. Right. So right. there's always something to be learned and gained by allowing other people in to, to help and creatively move you along. Yes, and from all these creatives, there was that thread that we talked about. And that thread, it, like you said, is to sustain the integrity of open-mindedness, collaborate, 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 focus on the story and bring that authenticity of making it your own. Um, make it your, make it yourself. Thomas Kell said, make it yourself and make it anywhere. I love it. I love it. Make it yourself, make it anywhere. Um, and, and, and Howell, the lighting guy. Rest in I peace. Said, um, go and see as much theater as you can see different works and see what inspires you so that you inspire your own craft so good my heart is so full right now is your heart full my heart is full yes. i can't burst i love it so um, yes make it your own people live be inspired live your truth and create and tell that story baby tell that tell that story, story. that's and i love it sorry one more thing that lynn said he's like oh if you hate hamilton great tell a story about how much you hate or tell a better story <laughs> tell another story about how much you hate it Exactly. What a great, what a great, great insane, tell that story. what a great way to think about it. Yes. Let it, you you gotta, it right. But that's part of letting it go, right? Let it go. Yes. It's awesome. Um, thank you everyone for joining us on this uh, yes. Hamilton deep dive off book series. Deep dive off book. Um, we hope you will join us for the next off book series. Yes. Um, we'll, we, will, we will announce later. Keep an eye on our social yes. media. Uh, yes. In the meantime, like, follow, subscribe. <laughs> Let us know if there are certain shows that you would like us to kind of open up a little bit more. Yes. If there's um, any creatives what out there that you? would like to <gasps> chat with us, please email yes. us. Um, yes. But uh, thank you for listening. And thank you for joining us again. Bye, everyone. Have a great night, everybody. Bye. We've appreciated listening. Bye.